Welcome back, folks, and thank you for joining us for another Soul Driven interview. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Jamie Howard, a body wisdom teacher and healer who has worked with women for over five years to shed layers of trauma, interrupt harmful patterns, and free themselves from societal expectations to reveal their true wild soul. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Jamie. Thanks, Anna. I'm so excited to be here. I'm super excited to have you. It's, it's been a long time coming, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit of background on Jamie. Her and I met online in a community back in 2019, and we ended up working together. I helped her to redesign her brand and her website. And well, we just really got to know each other and Pretty much from the very beginning, I was blown away with Jamie's story, what it is that she does, how she works with women. And I knew that at some point in time, I would end up having her on the podcast. So <laughs> here we inevitable. are, finally. <laughs> um, so let's just kind of jump right in. My first question with everyone, what makes you soul driven? Um, I would love to have like a really profound answer to this, but honestly, it's the alternative sucks <laughs> to, uh, to live so much of your life. Um, just sort of feeling like you're being pulled along <laughs> just, you know, trying to survive. Um, it sucks. That doesn't feel good. And so, um, when things really started to shift for me and I felt like, I was in the driver's seat of my own life um, and that I had a team um, of support and whatever that looks like because it changes all the time but that literally driven by my own soul and driven by the connection of my soul to other souls um, human or otherwise I think that's what makes it soul driven because honestly the alternative stinks. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I know that for myself, and I mean, says the generator. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what I would be doing if I wasn't doing things that I loved. I would right. kind of die, I feel like. Right. You know, I'd be like, what kind of an, or I'd, I would just be such a big pain in the ass because I'd be <laughs> awful to be around. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a strange, it's a strange thought to have to try to imagine what my life was like <laughs> before some of these really big shifts that happened. Um, because I think it's interesting, the very beginning of my life as like a little, a little girl um, felt very similar to what my life feels like now. But there's that chunk in the middle where it just felt like, you know, you're just trying to keep your head above water. Um I felt like life was happening to me and I was doing the very best that I could not to drown. Yeah, no doubt. I look back on my life and it's like before I launched my business, uh, my marketing business back in 2012, prior to that, basically every job I had just, it made me feel like I couldn't work for people. Like I was a failure. Like there was something wrong with me. Um, because of how intense I can be, because I <laughs> take too much initiative for, you know, I was either the favorite or the least favorite, and it was usually the least favorite, <laughs> um, <laughs> depending upon who my boss was and how secure they were, I guess. But, um, yeah, I always struggled through life and I even now kind of call myself unemployable because, I know that if I'm not doing what feeds my soul on some level, like there's just no possible way that I'm going to be happy. And that pervades everything else, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It feel it's a very different feeling. And when you, when you don't feel that way, it's hard to know how to get there. But when you're there, it's hard to imagine not being there. Does that make sense? <laughs> like, Absolutely. Hard yeah. to imagine not feeling that way. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in the midst of, the biggest shift in my adult life transitioning from my marketing agency into you know my spiritual practice and 
and and it's huge and I have no idea what it is that I'm doing necessarily but you know and in the midst of it I've taken on like a part-time job to help pay the bills and those kinds of things so I can really put my focus into building my spiritual practice Mm -hmm. um and thankfully I was able to find something that I enjoy even though it's not like (laughs) it's not a soul-driven job but um but I enjoy it, you know, for sure. its for its own things. But I just think about like re-entering the workforce if that was something I had to do. Because of course, in the midst of the transition, I've had to consider those things. And it's like, oh my gosh, going to get a nine to five, like ah, I think <laughs> I would die. I really do. I know it sounds dramatic, but is that how you feel? Like if you think about the same thing, you know, it's interesting. I um, I started this business five years ago, like you said, and, um, every summer I get texts or phone calls or, uh, emails or whatever from, I used, I used to work in the, in the local school district. And so every summer I get questions from, uh, friends of mine or people that I know that are still in the system and they're asking, Hey, we need a counselor. Would you be willing to come back? Or, uh, we have a teaching position open. Would you be willing to come back? And, and as each year goes by, it's, easier and easier for like a that's a hard pass like that's a hell no no <laughs> you don't have enough money to pay me to go back to something that I know just wasn't my place in time but um that has gotten easier over time but at first it was I had to really think about would the money be good sure would the security be good that's an illusion anyway with you know with the health benefits or that kind of things but would it make me feel safer I mean, it probably should, but I don't know if, if I have the space to feel really safe, if I'm miserable, if I'm in a place where I, I know that I just don't belong. So yeah, I think it does feel the same whenever you, um, whenever you figure out what you don't want to feel. Yeah. That's sometimes easier to identify. (laughs) Right. I think it's interesting that you point out the trap to, you know, the trap of security Mm -hmm. and, and what that is but we don't think about what it is we're giving up in the meantime. That's right. And I think for people like you and I, who've at least had a taste of what it is to be soul driven, like there's just like, yeah, there's just no going back, you know, like even if I have to maybe take on a side job or do something, you know, momentary, like forget Mm -hmm. it. Like I know where I'm going. I have no idea how to get there, but I know what it feels like. And I'll, I'll come home to that feeling at some point in time. Yeah. I think anytime for me, anytime that I'm looking to someone else or to an entity or a system outside of myself to provide safety or security for me, I already know that I've, I've jumped ship somewhere. Um, Cause I, it's nobody else's job. It, it's my responsibility to make sure that I feel safe and secure in whatever ways, physically, monetarily, whatever. Um, and anytime that I'm looking to someone else or something else to provide that for me, I automatically know, okay, I need to take a step back because that's an illusion. The fact that they will provide me with safety or security, that's not real. So I, I automatically know that's a cue that I can give myself to be like, okay, you know, mind mind your business, come back to you. (laughs) What can you do to provide that for yourself and not look to someone else? So that helps. I love that actually. I think that's, that's huge. That's profound. That's um, yeah. That was exactly what I needed to hear today, Jamie. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) That's a quotable. It's a tweetable. Um, (laughs) So before we get too lost off on all of the ways in which we could talk about this, um, I want to bring it back to you because of course you're here and your story is huge. So Your work with women, you have a very heartbreaking, heartbreaking yet powerful story that led you to begin your work with women. Um, Can you share, you know, a bit about your background and then kind of lead us into that story that brought you to the work you do today? So, um, like I mentioned before, my my background is in education and um, counseling. And so I got to I, and I had so much fun in that. And I, there are parts of that that I really miss. Um, I got to work with elementary all the way up through high school as 
a teacher, uh, art teacher, which is the most fun job on the planet. Um, (laughs) And then eventually as a counselor, and I thoroughly enjoyed that work so much. And then really quickly started to realize that I was um, kind of bound by the fact that our state, our country just doesn't really understand exactly how to use school counselors. So I wasn't able to really do the kind of counseling and working with with those kids that I really felt like I was being led to do. So um, I took the big leap and quit my job and started this business. And that happened about the same time, kind of in the middle of a seven year uh, period of time where my husband and I were trying to get pregnant. And anyone who's ever experienced infertility or any version of that, uh, seven years is a really long time. (laughs) That's a really long time to be asked, continuously asking that question. And so, you know, we had done all the things and asked all the questions and we had seen all the people and um, talked to all the experts and nobody could really give me real information to grab onto that I could really change uh, to get pregnant, to change the circumstances. And so when I quit my job, that was kind of right in the middle of that, that journey. And I, of course, everything works out and the timing that's perfect, of course, always. So it was right about that time that I felt probably the, the heaviest weight of that infertility journey. I had um, just experienced a a third miscarriage at that point. Um, Very, very early, so early in fact that I didn't know that I was pregnant. Um, And that was the third time that it happened um, where I would have this experience that was painful and unexpected and messy and, and not really knowing how to navigate that because they're never the same. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how many times you go through that. It's, it's always going to be painful and weird and strange. And um, so I just come out, I just come out of that third experience with that. And I started to feel myself kind of fall into this um, spiral, you know, when you, you spin out because your brain does cruel things. And I found myself once again, having the next cycle where we didn't get pregnant um, all the emotions that come with that experience. And of course, just the hormones that change throughout a cycle. Anyway, um, I found myself standing in my bathroom mirror. Um, I just got out of the shower, so I was completely naked and it's like late at night. And I had been crying, like sobbing, ugly crying for, I don't know, all day, two days, who knows, you lose track of time at that point. (laughs) But like, I, I looked at myself in the mirror and I remember feeling just absolute disgust that once again, my body had failed me. That this thing that I'm supposed to be able to do because I'm a female, so that's what a female body does, right? And all the judgments around that. Um, What she wasn't performing like I needed her to perform. And so I stood in the mirror and I actually said with like, it's, I could see it now, like this, like red eye, like rage in my eyes. <laughs> I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, um, if you can't be a mother, you here. Why, why do you exist if you can't do this one thing? And it was so interesting because in that moment, I heard that come out of my mouth and I knew what I was actually saying. And it kind of surprised me that I was at that point. And then of course, not really. And I swear to you as clearly as I'm hearing your voice now, (laughs) I heard this um, audible message come back. Um, Right question, wrong attitude, Mm. ask again. And so I just sort of took a deep breath and automatically I could see the the energy in my face and my body shift and soften and so I looked at myself again in the mirror and I said if your body is not going to produce a baby then how else can you be a mother why else are you here again it was basically the same question but 
very different attitude. And it was at that moment that I physically felt this um, permission for me to be exactly who I am, for my body to function exactly how she was functioning, (laughs) for all the things to be happening exactly the way that they were happening. And it literally felt like I had sort of shed um, like an old coat. There was a freedom in that that I didn't understand totally. And I didn't know what the next step was supposed to be, but there was a freedom in that, that I didn't have the um, obligation to perform a certain way in order to earn the right to be a real woman. I didn't have to earn the title real mother by pushing a human out of my body. Like that wasn't the, (laughs) that's not the only way that you can be a mother. Um, And so from that moment on, I really got to, explore what that meant and uh, we don't have children now um I take that back we have two four-legged children that are very much our children (laughs) so I never I never got pregnant and I that has shifted so significantly for me that um I realized in my mind that I was kind of setting the women's movement back like 150 years because I realized I was saying like, if you can't have a baby, then you don't have any purpose here. If you can't reproduce, then you don't get to be here or, you know, you don't have, you don't have a purpose that you're serving. Um, And when that shifted, I think everything sort of, the skies just opened up. Every possibility became a thing everything became a possibility. And um, I remember having a conversation with my parents. I'm an only child. So I was their only chance at grandchildren. I remember having a conversation with my parents where I actually said to them, I need you to be okay with the fact that you're not going to have grandchildren in the way that, you know, we typically assign that. And I had the same conversation with my husband who if there's anybody on the planet that should be a daddy to a child, like it's that man. And I said, I had to say to him, I need you to be okay with the fact that this is not going to happen the way that we thought it would. And of course, not surprisingly, everybody else had an easier time with that than I did, but, (laughs) but that was really the shift for me. I mean, but what a, what a huge, huge, I mean, if this is something that you want and you're married to a wonderful man, And like Mm -hmm. you say, you're the last, or you're the only child. I mean, there's nothing wrong with like wanting it and, or feeling like there's something wrong with you for not being able to give it, you know? I mean, that's just, I'm, I'm on the other side where I feel like in my life, because I never wanted kids. Mm -hmm. And then maybe like, you know, the past 10 years of my life, maybe it's kind of been like, well, you know, if it, if it happens, I'd be okay with that. Um, but I've had to ask myself so many times, like, am I really okay with that? Like, am I as much of a woman because I don't want kids, you know, That's right. That's and, right. and go back and forth while well, everyone around me is having children, you know, like everyone that I went to high school with basically has kids. I mean, it's, you know, I'm going to be 40 this year and yeah. I don't even have a goldfish. (laughs) Um, But I think that these are just, you know, like as women, we're born into this world. We are conditioned in this way. Even, you know, with the most aware parents, I think that there's just, you know, it infiltrates our life, whether through magazines or TV or our friends, you know, that being a mother is what makes us a real woman, like you said. So there's so, there's so much wrapped up in the, um, not only the definition of power, um, the picture of grace and strength. And I mean, if you ask any woman who's ever had a child, what the moment she's most proud of, or, um, you know, something about her life that she really, uh, grasps onto for value, I, most likely she's going to say the fact that she's a mom or that she, raised kids or, you know, that that was a part of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. When you're on the other side of that, though, my question was always, wait a minute. So if that's the most honorable job you can have is to be a mother, what does that mean for me if I'm not 
a mother. <laughs> like, so do, I just don't get to have that. I don't get to experience the magic of that. So what does that mean for me? And I think that's what this work, that experience really informs the work that I do because 95% of my clients are mothers. And that's so, not that I look for that specifically, but it's so interesting to me because it consistently puts me in a position to ask them that question, but who are you? Like, that's one part of you, but that's not everything that you're about. Who else are you? What, what other parts of you are also equally as valuable? Because I'm on that side of it, I, I get to bring that, that kind of um, depth, I think, to that process, which has been amazing. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, as humans, we, we always kind of add some like hierarchy to things, right? Sure. Oh, well, like this is better than this and whatever. Um, and I think, you know, I think mothers are like, I've always been in awe of them, but through COVID, I'm like, y'all are legit superheroes. I don't even know how you do yes. it. <laughs> right. Again, I struggled and I don't even have a goldfish. I can't right. imagine <laughs> dealing with, you know, a partner and kids and this and career like, oh my gosh, yes. just epic. Um, but I don't, you know, and I think that like, this is kind of, this is the perspective shift that you had. It's like, it's not, there is no better than or right. worse than or right. It's what is for us, you know? I think women right. who are meant to be mothers, amazing, be a mother. And mm -hmm. then I think those of us who aren't, whether by choice or, you know, because we're not able to, whatever the case may be. Um, I mean, I haven't ever tried to get pregnant. Who's to say that I could, you right. know? But um, we, we have other responsibilities to mothering and it certainly takes away no, I mean, like look at Oprah, right? Mm -hmm. She has no children and she's like everybody's mom. Right. <laughs> Every time I hear her talking, I'm like, sounds like my mother is talking right. to me. Like a mother. I shouldn't say my mom, but a mother, right. you know? Right. It's like she's yes. like, girl, you better blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yes. Um, and what a powerful gift to be able to give. So I want to ask you a couple of questions about this experience um, because I feel like it's so, you know. It's so huge. And I think that a lot of what happened there, I would assume informs the work you do now. But um, so first I'd just love to ask, it was seven years that you tried to get pregnant. Like, how did you take care of yourself in the meantime, like through that? Because I just have to feel like if I was trying to hit a goal every month and for that long, not able to, I mean, you know, just, the destruction that would have been had in my head and all of that. I would love to hear how, how you took care of yourself through that time. Uh, yeah, for a bulk of that, I didn't. <laughs> um, it was messy and gross and I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, it was a lot of, um, I felt lost most of the time. So it was a lot of, self-destruction in a lot of ways and and then guilt about that because there was always the question that am I making this worse because I'm not somehow magically loving myself through this like I, I didn't I couldn't figure out what that looked like um I think on the surface I understood that and I, I needed to be as patient as possible <laughs> um with this process because there's not like there's an instruction manual for this so um I think on the surface, I tried to just kind of ride the wave as best I could. Uh, but inside, it was a mess. I, I hated myself. I hated my body. I hated the world. I, I hated nature. I hated my husband. I hated, I hated everything because none of it was working in, in my favor the way that I wanted to. Obviously, it was working in the background, but um, it was bad. It was dark. And that's why, I mean, as much as I you know, those words coming out of my mouth as I'm looking in the mirrors didn't obviously didn't feel good and felt strange to sort of be in that place, but it didn't really surprise me. And I, 
it wasn't really until that moment. It was the bulk of that seven year period that were, it was dark and I didn't know how to reach out for help. I didn't even know what kind of help I would be looking for. Um, I'm incredibly blessed to have friends and family and, you know, a community that love me. And I have no questions about that. And that experience was so isolating that every woman I knew was getting pregnant around me. And that made me feel like I needed to insulate even more. And so, yeah, a bulk of that, I didn't really take care of myself. I was just trying to, I don't know, roll from one moment to the next as best I could, but it was dark. It was pretty ugly. Um, after that sort of shift in my perspective, everything became about reinventing the relationship that I have with my body, um, specifically reinventing the relationship that I have with my um not just the reproductive organs, but like the womb space in a little bit more ethereal sense, um, that an energetic space, um, reinventing my relationship with sex, that it wasn't just the thing you do to reproduce, which became mechanical and really not fun at all. Um, I think after that shift, it became really more about curiosity and exploration, which for me, the way that my brain works is so much fun that I didn't really feel the need or the draw to be sad about it anymore. It was more about like, okay, I'm going to turn this page and I'm excited about how this may look in the future. It wasn't about getting pregnant anymore. It was about having a relationship with my body that, um, that felt fresh and nourishing. And the fact that that was even an a possibility while also not getting pregnant was brand new to me. So taking care of myself after that point became so much easier because it was really just about discovering this um, new aspect of being me. Yeah. So how was it that kind of, because of course you asked the question in the mirror, basically like, why am I here if I'm not going to be a mother? Mm -hmm. How did, how did that shift into like, I've got to reestablish, recreate this relationship with my body? Was it from all the destruction that you knew you had to rebuild or? You know, it was actually really, it was a really simple thought of this weird, super limited, um, responsibility or pressure that I was putting on myself. I really just imagined if I was applying that to anybody else, because I thought this is so awful. <laughs> this feels so gross. Do I, am I apply, do I apply that to any other woman on the planet? And of course the answer is no. And that was like a tire screeching moment for me. Cause I thought, why the hell do I, why am I doing this to me when I don't think anybody else should follow that? logic, you know, that you're a woman, so you must reproduce. I wouldn't apply that to anybody else. And um, that for me was just, it was a hard stop. And so I felt like in that moment, it became so clear that this rule that I was putting on myself was based solely on the fear that if I couldn't be a mother, quote unquote, in the way that I had sort of assigned that, that I just had no purpose. And then there was nothing for me to do here. When that shifted into, but you get to decide that. <laughs> like I get to decide what mother looks like. I get to decide that. And I hear that from people constantly, my clients all the time, feeling like when they come into my space, because I see clients here in my home. So when I, they come into that space or even when I meet with them virtually, that the space that I'm holding for them feels so warm and inviting and maternal that automatically that tire screeching moment, I was like, well, clearly this doesn't apply. <laughs> this is stupid. It doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to anybody else. And I think that was sounded kind of the, the pivotal moment for me. So were there any like particular practices or anything like that, that you incorporated through that time where you were rebuilding that relationship with your body? 
one of my favorites um, was I, I, I like to journal and I love looking for different ways to journal. That's not just your diary, <laughs> you know, that are different ways to use that tool. And so um, I came up with this idea. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's thought of this, but so I can't claim full credit, but I came up with this idea of um, developing a dialogue with my uterus, <laughs> developing an actual relationship, just like you would if you were to meet somebody for the first time. And so I started writing letters to my womb space. I started writing letters to my body as a whole and then like specific organs and then would write back to myself from the perspective of that organ or that space or that whatever body part I was writing to. Um, and that's really where the term for me, that's where the term body wisdom actually comes from is that idea that there's already so much information that is within my own physical and energetic body that I didn't really, I didn't need someone else necessarily to guide me in that way. Although I welcomed any kind of support, but it was really the conversation that was happening between myself and these parts of my body that I felt so separated from. Um, that was the tool that really, I think, helped to open that space a little bit more. I love that. That's really cool. Um, I'm also a huge fan of journaling. I'm pretty sure we've talked about this plenty yeah. of times before. <laughs> so what were maybe like in the midst of this time period with you redeveloping this relationship with yourself, how was this starting to inform or redirect or whatever the work that you were doing? Uh, with I noticed, others? yeah, I noticed that that wasn't the only, for myself, that wasn't the only rule that I had sort of arbitrarily put in place that was really limiting. Um, I started to find other places in my life where I had limited myself and put so much pressure on myself to operate in like this very specific way that doesn't have to be that way. Um, and so as I started working with other clients, that's kind of what I was looking for in what they would talk about feeling so um, limited in certain ways that I would start asking those questions. Well, what rules do you have around that? Um, that that's actually creating the limits. Does that make sense? Because I, yeah, it can so sort of vague to, to some people, but that's kind of how that moved. No, no, no. So to clarify, you're talking about like, you applied this same like perspective perspective shift of like I'm only I'm only worthy if I'm a mother right right to like other areas of your life like wait right. a minute like where else am I where mm -hmm. else do I have these limiting thoughts that's what you mm -hmm. mean right yes yeah and that recognizing how that's that it is programming I mean recognizing how often and um widespread that programming is happening starting so young and and you step out into the world and it's all over the place um, there was a sense of awareness that started to really open up for me that I could notice where there I'm finding evidence of like that programming still happening and there's more and more of it and god forbid you start watching television like that's, there's just so much of that reinforcement that becoming more aware of it really helped me understand what is me and what is what everyone wants me to be or what you know the world tells me I'm supposed to be. Um, what American society or even just my local area says that as a woman you should be like this. I began to be able to kind of separate that and so as I continued to work with clients I could see that, I could hear that behind what they were actually saying, if that makes sense. Um, one of my gifts is to be able to hear someone literally hear what they're saying, but also be able to sense kind of what's happening behind that. And so I could hear some of those, I mean, same limiting beliefs and rules and this weird constructs that, you know, they felt bound by. I could hear that behind a lot of what they were talking about that was painful for them. And so that immediately informed how I work with those clients for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We are all, I mean, it's, it's just, even in my own uh, work, 
that I'm work that I'm doing right now um, with my psychotherapist. It's it's just it blows my mind when I come across a new belief that I've had that A I wasn't even aware of and B was like totally wrecking my game. <laughs> And it's like, wow, you know, and then being able to discover the root of where that came from and how it dug its way, you know, dug its heels into my life. Yeah. Um, it's very powerful to uncover these things about us. Did you, I'm not, I'm not going to go off there. Um, <laughs> really? yeah, I do want to share, I do want to share something really quickly, actually, yeah. that I have found to be super helpful and it gets kind of to the core of something really quickly um, is I'll, I'll ask a client, how, how do you want to feel? Not what do you want in your life necessarily like material wise, but how do you want to feel? And let's say someone says, you know, I want to feel um, at peace. I'll ask the next question is usually in what ways are you consciously or otherwise throwing up roadblocks to that and why? Because the fact is we don't do anything for free. There's always a there's always a payoff for stuff, even if it seems twisted and weird. Like, why would we want to not feel at peace? There, there's reasons why. And so being able to identify some of the reasons why we keep things messy and chaotic in our lives because it feels familiar and familiar means safe. Something similar like that. It being able to identify that really quickly, it's all happening under the surface, but we sometimes we're not consciously aware of it so being able to identify that really quickly makes that process so much easier yeah absolutely absolutely yeah I I remember years ago it was like over a decade ago with my ex-fiance we weren't engaged at the time but I'd gone to my therapist and I'm all about that therapy <laughs> yeah <me too>. um, <laughs> and uh you know and I was talking to him about how like uh, in my relationship, like these arguments kept happening. It was like this, you know, loop and I didn't understand it. And he was like, well, tell me about your childhood. And I was like, well, my parents fought constantly and uh, there would be plates crashing up against the wall sometimes. Yeah. And like, you know, and he was like, whether this is something that you love or even agree with, this is yeah. normal to you. So yeah. you can vehemently hate it, disagree with it, all, all of that. But if that is normal to you, then that is something that you're going to, you know, recreate in your own life. Um, and that was huge for me. That was very eye opening. Um, so how did you kind of turn this, the pain that you carried from your, well, I guess, let me take a step back. First, I'd love for you to kind of just describe for us, uh, define like what body wisdom is for you. This may actually answer the question that you were getting ready to ask also, because I think um, body wisdom is for me exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's the information that's actually held in your body that we feel in all of the different ways. We like body wisdom that feels good. <laughs> like, we like the stuff that feels really peaceful and um, orgasmic or calm or excited. We like that wisdom. There's also wisdom inside of pain. <laughs> it's literally information. And so for me, the definition of body wisdom is literally the information that comes through our body in all of the different ways. And so it could be physical, literal, physical pain um, or a physical, literal sense of euphoria, whatever that may be. Or it's um, that more energetic kind of ethereal, hard to put your thumb on information that comes through in your dreams or the quote unquote gut feeling that you get um, when you your intuition kicks in in a certain way and you know that you know that something is one way or another that it's all body wisdom and I think part of my work that's really important to me is bringing in making sure that we include feelings like pain and sadness and isolation and rage um, shame and guilt it's all information 
And there are all ways that we feel that physically and otherwise in our body. And that literally is the wisdom that we can use if we, once we become aware to it, it's the wisdom that we can use to literally make decisions on how our life looks, how to step forward. And so that, that's a big part of it, including pain in that as a valuable resource, um, a valuable source of information is I think something that's very important to me. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, there's so much uh, wisdom and discomfort. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and it makes sense that we don't like it. It doesn't feel good, but it doesn't mean that it's not useful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, like think about the everyday life in regards to how we actually create change. Right. We don't create change when we're comfortable, when things are all going great, because why would we? Right. <laughs> you know, like uh, change I, usually comes from us getting fed up or something happening or sure. whatever the case may be. Um, so how did you take this pain and this understanding of body wisdom and, and start working with wisdom or with women <laughs> to cultivate like a relationship with their bodies to heal that relationship? Uh, so much of that is really just understanding what intuition is, um, how information comes to you and where it comes from. If, if you wanted to take it there, because first, you know, everybody that's a, for everybody, that's a personal individual experience, but being able to recognize when you know that the answer is no, in O to something, being able to trust that that's the real answer. And you don't have to answer any other way than no, that's a complete sentence. <laughs> no, period. I'm not going to commit to that because I can tell that that's not something that I need to do or, or whatever. I think that is probably the first step in that. That was certainly the first step for me was being able to recognize what language my body is speaking um, so that I can understand when that information comes through, how to heal myself, how to make decisions, um, I mean, how to make decisions even within my business or my finances or my relationships, my body is really all I need. And whether I believe that that information is coming from God or source or the earth or that part doesn't matter to me as much as understanding what the information is and what the language is so that I can, I can use that as a a guide. And so when I work with clients, that's usually where we start is really recognizing Um, how do you receive intuition? Like, what does that feel like to you? How do you know when something's a hard yes or a definite no? And, and we go from there. Sticking into their experiences, thinking about how they feel in their body in the midst of those responses. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, like you said, the body knows all. <laughs> it's truly where all of our wisdom is. <laughs> yeah. I talk about that a lot on this podcast. Yeah. Um, so I know for myself that like, um, I, you know, in my retail business that I created, it was for women. It was swimwear. It was all about empowerment. And one of the biggest understandings that I got in the midst of that, you know, two years of working on that brand, working with women, working with their bodies, whole nine yards was just really having this huge epiphany that like women who are truly comfortable with their bodies are unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Um, Is this something that you see within your clients or you just see them transform once they begin healing this relationship with their body? (laughs) Uh, For sure. I mean, I mean, the difference is it's such, I cannot believe that I get to do this for a living. Like I wake up every morning and I'm like, I can't believe this is my job because it's such an honor and a privilege to watch layers and layers of just bullshit fall off of someone and then really feel like they are showing up for the first time in the world as themselves and not feeling like they need to change that so that they're more palatable <laughs> for other people or other, uh, other situations. What I notice is that when we're able to do that with how they literally physically feel in their own body, 
then a lot of the other areas in their life kind of fall into place with that. Like you said, there's, there's this power in that um, okayness of being in the body that you're in. And that doesn't mean that you don't want to change certain things about it. That's, that's fine. That's not a problem, but being able to recognize that you are exactly who you are (laughs) and that you don't need to apologize for that. You don't need to shift that in any way so that you're easier for other people to understand. And I think that in however, whatever way that translates, whether it's around uh, pregnancy and fertility, like my own experience, or if it's, um, you know, women that are single that, that want to be in a relationship, but they're really struggling to find a relationship that feels like they're in the right place at the right time, that it, it all translates into all these different life experiences where when you know that you are exactly who you are supposed to be, just because you are, you didn't have to earn that. There's nothing you need to change about yourself to be that. But knowing that you are exactly who you're supposed to be because you're in this body that you're supposed to have allows you to step into the world uh, just feeling more comfort more comfortable in it all including discomfort feeling more comfortable in discomfort whatever way that looks like it allows you to step forward with, with a little bit more power a lot more power so it's i feel like yeah i can only imagine um i feel like this is such a long process is it and i guess it would depend upon the person I mean, I know for myself, it's been a lifelong process, process mm-hmm. I'm still in the midst of. Um, maybe for other women, it's not so much of a lifelong process. But what, what are some of the steps that you take with them, you know, just high level in regards to that process of actually like reconnecting and accepting themselves and their body? I mean, the first step is recognizing that there isn't a destination. So It's not like you go through the process and then you arrive and you're done. Um, Because that looking at it that way, it would probably seem like you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. But the fact is you are, because there is no like ending. (laughs) I mean, there is an ending, but, (laughs) but not to the process itself. You know what I mean? So I think that's, that's kind of the first thing that we talk about a lot of times is um, recognizing that you're not, it's not like you got on this train And you're hoping to get as much done as you can before the next stop, because you've only got six months to do this work and then you need to get on with it. Um, It is lifelong work. And something that I focus a lot on is being willing to be number one, being willing to be uncomfortable. And I I tell every single client that signs on to work with me, this is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to change your life. And it's also going to be uncomfortable. (laughs) and worth every minute of that. So being okay with being uncomfortable and knowing that you're, you're gonna survive that, but also allowing yourself to be in, in whatever phase of that experience that you're in and not feel like you need to change it because it doesn't feel good. Being able to be in those places where you're really struggling to understand why you're not getting pregnant or why you're not you know, finding the right person that you really want to be with, why, why that's not happening is allowing yourself to be in that discomfort, allowing yourself to be in that moment and see it for what it is, see the wisdom in that. And usually when that happens, you move through that a lot quicker. Actually, you're not stuck there forever, but that's the, that's usually how we start is just understanding that. Yeah. None none of this is comfortable. That's not where real change happens. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah, it takes time. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the ways that uh, we ignore our body? We have so many ways. <laughs> we have lots of options. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, I think that for folks who are listening to this, for women who are listening to this, so many of us are unaware of how yeah. we're ignoring, you know? and. Yeah. And just being able to name some of those could be really helpful, especially for those of us who, I mean, for the longest time, like when I look back on my younger years, I was, 
I've always been very disconnected from my body. It's always been very hard for me. Like when I got into the metaphysical and the spiritual community, I mean like grounding, freaking forget it. I did everything underneath the sun and it was like, nah, no, nah, not working, not working. Like <laughs> right. it took me a long time to realize that I ground best through movement. That's just me, mm-hmm. you know, but um, I, I miss and I still miss to this day so much of what is happening within my body because I am a very external person. You know, my, my path is very much about coming more internal. And, and I think that's just for a lot of us out there, right? Sure. We, sure. we have no idea. It's like, you know, there's that small achy thud that's like happening in your body for like two years before you go to the doctors. And then all of a sudden you find out you have like throat cancer or something or, you know, because like right. you haven't been paying attention to your body. Right. So yeah. I think one to... of the, go ahead. I, I think one of the, the things that's interesting is when we, if we don't know what it feels like to um, take a deep breath, if we don't know what that really feels like, then you don't know when you're not doing that. And so I would say I something right off the bat is to just be able to identify, are you breathing from up here? Are you taking a breath where your belly expands big and round? Like that's one small example of ways that it's not that we're ignoring it on purpose. It's like, we don't give ourselves an opportunity to even check in. And when you can feel what an actual deep breath feels like, it gives you the opportunity to notice if you're always breathing from up here, your shoulders are up by your ears. It's a constant stress state. It's a con- it's a it's being in that fight or flight or uh, freeze kind of place all the time. And in the world we live in, I, I get it. I understand that. But that doesn't mean you don't have access to just asking the question, like, where are my shoulders? <laughs> where am I breathing from? Those are two, honestly, every time that I see people on the street or in the post office or like, I noticed that because I'm constantly asking that question. I notice that. And I, I wonder if, if that person realizes that I can see that they're breathing like this, <laughs> I can hear them talking that they're not taking a deep breath. So I think that just really to simplify it, that's one of the first two things that I, I think that we just don't even notice. Okay. So how, talk with me about a couple of the different ways in which you work with clients. So I have, um, we're very fortunate to have a beautiful home with a lot of space. And I have clients that come from as far away as, you know, an hour and a half that will come out here physically and will sit in um, my healing room and we'll have conversations. We'll um, work through some of those processes. I also do uh, guided meditation and, and sound healing. And so a lot of them will come for that too. Um, so that's, I mean, I know you're, you're not supposed to have a preference, but I do love doing that. I like meeting with people face to face. But I also have uh, clients that I meet with virtually. And what's interesting is that they're, it's not less potent. <laughs> it's just as powerful when I'm meeting with clients virtually. And um, it's a lot of talk therapy, um, just sort of talking through what they're feeling. I always start with the same question, like, what do you have for me today? Like, <laughs> you know, how are you feeling today? What do you want to talk about today? And just let the floodgates kind of open. Um, but yeah, that mainly it's, it's mostly just having conversations and allowing the space that I create the safe, genuinely safe and comfortable space that I create, whether it's physically or virtually, allowing that to give you permission as the client to just sort of word vomit. Whatever's happening is happening and and we'll sort through it. Okay. So you do like in person, you do online and I know you started doing retreats as well, correct? Yes. So finally, (laughs) after a hiatus because of COVID, um, finally we were able to get back to those and we had one, um, this year in June. Um, we had, I think we had 12 women. Um, we all come together at a, a location that's kind of, it's not out in the woods, but I mean, it's out in kind of a little secluded area. Um, and it's three days of just glorious 
nourishing being together, connecting. I mean, it's truly magical. Um, and it's now the, the next one coming up is in November. Um, now I'm, I'm actually adding another day. So it'll be four days and I'll be able to incorporate a little bit more into that experience. But that's probably my absolute favorite thing to do on the planet is to sit in space in a space where there is a circle of women, whether it's three or 30 all together being vulnerable in the same space, absolute magic happens. <laughs> it's so powerful, so powerful. And I'm, I'm really fortunate to do that. Yeah. When you bring energy together, it's, it's huge. It's palpable. Mm-hmm. I personally like the smaller groups, but <laughs> sure. I started I actually. Guys, this. So it's like, I really <laughs> feel, I'm like, I'm cool with like a room full of men, but put me around like three to five women. And I'm like, <laughs> and you're not the only one Mo- most women that's actually the first first day of every retreat is usually a half day so it's we usually start in the afternoon into the evening that's what we're kind of untangling um because we're all having those same thoughts My- myself included I get I'm nervous too um sitting in a room full of women has not been the most um uh, fantastic experience for a lot of us so yeah, that's actually the first thing we sort of address. And what's fascinating to me is being able to see once we all address that and realize that we're all thinking the same thing, all of those walls kind of fall away. And so by the second day, when we start first thing in the morning, um, those ladies are different. They're not wasting the energy on trying to protect themselves because there's nothing to protect them from. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Well, women, I mean, like we all want to be together, you know, it's yeah. a thing like we so want that and women need each other. Yes. I mean, I think men need each other, you know, in their own way for sure. Yeah. But like women like need each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. Um, I think it's very powerful. My last workshop, it was, it was perfect. Um, uh, five women showed up and I, yeah, it it was so nice to share that space and, yeah. and get to spend that time. Um, okay. So I guess just kind of like any, is there any final things that you want to cover before we jump into the lightning round? Um, I think, I, I guess I just wanted to say to anybody who's listening, if uh, so much of this feels for me, at least it, it felt um, hard. I mean, it was work I wanted to do, but it it felt heavy. It's a lot (laughs) and it's a lifelong journey. Um, and I just want, I want women, I want people to understand that that doesn't mean it's impossible or not worth it. And I think because of the kind of relationship that, especially in the media, um, that we have with bodies and just what they look like and what, how they're supposed to function, I would just ask that people really start questioning what what do you actually believe? What does your body actually want? Instead of doing that comparison thing of like, do I look like that? Does my life look like that? Just really giving yourself the opportunity to have your own voice. I think is just really important. So. Yeah, I fully, fully, fully couldn't agree more. I think one of the biggest things that I try to encourage on this podcast is for people to think for themselves you know because we've got so much coming at us and if we just take something that someone else has regurgitated as truth then we're selling ourselves short in so many different ways um and and i heard something really beautiful yesterday i read something it was a quote and i mean it's not like rocket science like you haven't heard this before but you know it just basically said that when we when we take the time to heal what's on the inside, everything on the outside comes together. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's really what you're speaking into in regards to like the process and why it's so important to start that journey and invest that time. Yes. You know, instead of trying to go into our external world and, Oh, well maybe I'll, you know, buy this outfit or I'll get my hair done like this or I'll, you know, get this boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. And, (laughs) Um, yeah, the the same things are always going to come to the surface. I mean, it's kind of like what I said before is if, if you're looking, 
comparison happens because you don't trust yourself enough. You compare yourself to someone else because you're looking for some sense of, of security or a guardrail somewhere to tell you that you're okay. And the fact is that's not real. You're the only one, no, you're the only one who knows if you're okay. And so when we can sort of look back to wait, okay, what, what do I need? Like, who am I? What is it? What is it that I'm doing here? When we trust our own voice, our own body wisdom, when we trust that, um, it doesn't really matter so much what's happening around us or outside of us. It doesn't have as much of an effect. And I think that's, that's kind of the magic moment when you realize, um, I don't really need anybody else to tell me that I'm okay. I'm good. <laughs> Cause I am, cause I know that I am. Yeah. Yeah, there's the, there's the true freedom, the true power. All right, lady, you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So number one, what is the one habit that you can't live without? Oh, man. I thought I was going to be so fast in answering these. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. Um I love um, pinching my husband's butt. <laughs> like every time we walk by each other, we do that. And I can't get rid of that. I can never let that go. <laughs> it's so good. I have to put my hands on. I can't help it. <laughs> Lucky man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number two, what does spirituality mean for you? Oh. Jeez, these are not lightning questions. <laughs> um, I think for me, it's communication, connection with whoever, whatever, whatever that looks like, whatever name you give it. I think spirituality for me is about that connection and, and how you talk to it. I dig it. Number three, what is your advice to anyone who is looking to find their purpose? I, I mean, it's kind of what we've been talking about this whole time that like, ask yourself, Just check in with you, what lights you up, what makes your body feel lit up. Okay. And number four, how can people connect with you online? <laughs> so I am on Facebook and Instagram at wild souls healing, wild souls, plural healing. Um, also I'm on, I have a website that someone super special that I get to talk to today <laughs> helped me create. And that's just a uh, wild souls healing.com. Those are the easiest ways to reach me. Perfect. All right, my dear. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, for spending time coming and hanging out and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Yes, yes. We'll have <laughs> you back. We'll have you back. Please. And, and maybe <laughs> if, if COVID wants to chill out, then we can do a retreat together. I would love that. That needs to happen for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you were inspired by today's interview, please leave a review on iTunes and subscribe. Be sure to check out the Soul Driven Collective, my Patreon community, where we extend this conversation into the one-on-one -on -one, or sign up for the email list to receive podcast updates. And don't forget when we invest in ourselves, the world benefits. Until next week.